But why do we have it underrated if it was so successful? I think because it's forgotten. I think The Ring has been forgotten Same. by audiences, mainstream audiences, and a lot of young audiences probably never heard of it or seen it. So on Letterboxd, it only has 13,000 reviews. Yeah, so that's why that's it's nothing. underrated. Hello, movie friends. It's spooky season. <laughs> and as you can tell from our set, if you're watching on Spotify or YouTube, we have this place decked out for the Halloween season. We're having a lot of fun with this. And we're going to do a special episode today talking about what we think are the most underrated horror movies of all time. You've probably heard of a bunch of these, but they're never on like the top 10 list. They're never really talked about online or on TikTok, social media. And we want to give them a little bit more love. These are films that we really enjoy. And we we rank them just as high as a lot of like the more popular horror films. And it's a list from all over the place in terms of years. We have movies from the 2000s, from the 80s, from recent films in the last like five years, as well as international films, movies from the 70s. So we think this is a great list of very underrated horror films that if you haven't seen any of these, I highly recommend checking them out. We won't spoil like the plots and endings of any of these movies because we want you to check them out at some time. But it's always fun. We love the horror genre and there's so many great movies out there that not many have heard of. But, you know, if there's some on this list that you think should be on there, we maybe had reasoning that, you know, maybe it's more popular than you think or critically they're very much acclaimed. Yeah. But I think that this is a solid list so far that yeah. we got. Yeah. And I, I come to realize that horror could possibly be my favorite genre for movies. I really love the genre. I love horror films. I love being scared. I love when filmmakers can get very creative with how they can elicit fear, the, the emotion of fear in the audience. And, and there's so many ways to do it. And I, it really has become one of, if not my favorite genre for film. I think it's I think it's the best genre, honestly, between that and sci-fi. I love sci-fi, but I think horror is special, especially if you can make a great horror film, then I think you're a great storyteller and great filmmaker. Yeah. Isn't that what Martin Scorsese says? Like, if you can make a great horror film, you're just, like, an exceptional director because horror is, like, the most visceral of all the forms of storytelling in movies. To elicit, I mean, to make an audience feel fear when they're in the safety of a movie theater in a comfy seat or in their home... That's a special thing to make like someone jump out of their couch when they're watching a movie and on their like in their at their home. So it's no other genre can do that. Make you react in such a way. I get ex so excited when I watch new horror movies. Like I go in knowing like I'm going to be terrified because I scare pretty <laughs> easy during movies. Squares. But I like it. It's like I like Cholula and hot sauce. And I, I put that on stuff on everything. Yeah. Yeah. You get a little dopamine. It's it's yeah, yeah exactly. So there's something about adrenaline. being scared buy a movie whether it be in the living room on the couch on the couch in the dark or like in a movie theater there's it's something addictive about it and i just can't help myself just going back to more and seeing seeing as many horror movies as i can in can't theaters. help it man just i love it, it. like i jump but like it's and i i like being terrified i get terrified but I, but i enjoy it and for me with horror i love the 2000s with how i really enjoy some of the uh, the torture porn that was coming out like that was like it's era that decade of like just super gory, messed up stuff. But it's it's my least favorite kind of horror. I like being scared. I like psychological horror. And I like true terror. I always found that just like super gory stuff was just kind of just like cheating, just grossing the audience out. I never really reacted well to those. And even if they are pretty good movies, I've always been like, oh, it's just like gross the whole time well, ver I, yeah. yeah versus like the original texas chainsaw massacre which is obviously one of the best horror films of all time but that gross is horrifying in so many different other ways yeah. i mean just like the the setting the set design the location and just like what you see on camera the world he built before yeah. the gore starts happening you're already grossed out by that movie for different reasons versus just like watching someone get like horrifically stabbed or yeah or like the torture stuff in the in the later saw movies because i like the first saw movie a lot but yeah. the later ones are just too much for me it got yeah it got in in like eli Roth's Hostel was a good example where it's a good movie, but then like that kind of saw and Hostel just like created this desire for just like gore, 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 cut up bodies and just like Ugh. the most crazy. And it's messed up. Some it, people like it. Yeah, some people like it. But I, I, I think that we've come into like the last 10 years, a new renaissance of horror. And then the 70s and 80s were great for horror. So I, I, I prefer just like more psychological, terrorizing, um, suspenseful horror as opposed to just bloody also, what I adore about horror films is most of them are low budget, just really well executed movies and executed stories with directing and acting and set design and everything like that. Or if you have a great monster or a great villain that's haunting the the 
protagonists in the film, but they're generally not very high budgets and they're just such well-made movies. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why I like them so much is that we don't have like $100 million horror movies. They're just usually like, the, the best ones are sometimes two, $3 million budget movies. And it's crazy and incredible to see what these directors and filmmakers can do with such low budgets. I mean, something like Sinister, that's a really low budget as well. I don't know if we'd put that on this list because it's pretty popular. Yeah. I think like Sinister- It's not and, underrated. I know a lot of people, we, we took a poll and people were like, Sinister, The Conjuring. I, I feel like when you make a franchise out of it, it's not yeah, underrated. Yeah, it's not underrated. So yeah. obviously Sinister is a franchise, but the sequels weren't that great. But the original is really well liked. And I think that's not underrated. Same thing with The Conjuring. Those movies are great. They're all- But there's five of them yeah. now, you know what I mean? But also, so everyone likes the conjuring yeah. that i talked to so I, I can't consider it um, underrated and also they're all extremely popular like the conjuring movies all make a lot of money so mm -hmm. they make a lot of money and they're critically and audience wise like loved then you can't call it underrated they're the current like kind yeah. of just a uh, haunted house franchise right now yeah. of this like last decade. and they do a good job i really like number two i like number three a lot they like for a franchise to just keep it pretty consistent for all three so far they did a good job now how about we get into our list of underrated horror movies <laughs> again this isn't every underrated horror movie there are plenty out there that aren't on this list but i think we're gonna start strong with a movie that we really really like called the descent if you haven't seen this movie it came out in 2005 imdb has us at a 7.2 ron tomatoes 86 percent written and directed by neil marshall a box office of 57 million dollars so this made a ton of money on a low budget and this film is terrifying. It's about a group of friends who go to try to discover, basically, and name a new underground under, yeah, under cave, system. cave system. And this is also a really great female-led cast. I don't know if anyone's ever it's seen all this women. movie. It's yeah. a complete female cast except for one guy that comes mm -hmm. in here and there. Mm -hmm. um, great performances. But as they go discovering this cave system, they're all climbers, they're all friends. They come across these monsters that live in this cave, cave system, which are, we're not spoiling it, this is all in the trailer. They have clearly, they seem to be humanoid, have developed inside this cave system or evolved in there, and they're just hunting them now. Yeah, and they, they get trapped inside the cave system, and it's an act, like, only one of them was like, we're going to discover this. The others thought they were just on a fun trip, and so they get trapped, and they're lost, basically. Oh, and so it's already horrifying with all the monsters. The claustrophobia is really great. Uh, Neil Marshall did a great job of putting you inside these caverns and these tunnels. And sometimes, like, you feel the claustrophobia some of the characters are feeling. And also the sense of there's no escaping this. And then the creatures show up and just start causing mayhem. And it's amazing creature design. A really terrific reveal. We saw this with our dad when we were, like, 14. <laughs> and it just horrified. It was one of the scariest movie experiences of my life. And it was great, and I really loved it. We watched it a lot. We had the DVD and the Blu-ray and stuff, but it really is terrific. It has a great balance of horror, uh, gore, um, just disturbing stuff. Um, it, the action's really great, and the cast did a phenomenal job. All the actresses really stood out and did a terrific job with their performances. But I think the creature design was so original, so unique, and really made the film. Because the, the idea of being trapped and lost inside undiscovered caves itself is terrifying and we don't get the monsters for quite a while in this movie and then they come so just combine that really great imagery and cinematography and use of light in this movie yeah, as well yeah because they the creatures they adapted to the cave so they can see in the dark and, and obviously the yeah. characters are only using whatever flashlights and whatever flares and lights yeah. they have to illuminate sticks, everything oh, so man. it's really terrifying Highly recommend it. However, if you really have issues with claustrophobia, you like can't watch movies like 13 Lives or something like this, then maybe not check it out. Yeah. Terrific film. Highly recommend. And it's underrated because I never see it on lists of great horror movies. Even if, even if you look up lists of like mo classic modern horror films, it's never on lists. So it's not talked about enough. And also 7.2. I mean, I give this an 8.5 at oh, least. It's, it's excellent. Yeah, it really it's terrific. is. They made a couple sequels. I know they made one. I think they uh, made three. I haven't seen the yeah. sequels, but I just love the original. Yeah, me too. Next up, we have a South Korean horror film called I Saw the Devil, which came out in 2011. This IMDb is a 7.8. It's probably the best critically, the most critically acclaimed film on this list. Rotten Tomatoes, 81%. Directed by Kim Ji Woon, who's a great South Korean director and a box office return of only $13 million. Pretty good. It, w it probably would make more money nowadays that uh, audiences have grown to love South Korean cinema and TV. But that's still a huge box office yeah, for a South Korean very film Very big back box then. office. This movie, it's one of the, like, 
best, most disturbing, exciting, unpredictable horror films of all time. It's really completely original, and it's crazy. It's about this guy who's a professional killer, and then his his wife is killed by a serial killer. So then he tracks down the serial killer to kill him, but he doesn't just kill the serial killer. He torments the serial killer by like beating him into the in, into an inch of his life over and over again over time, just completely making this guy suffer until the serial killer becomes the victim of the lead character. And that's basically the setup of the film. There's a lot of twists, lots of surprises, and it's just so exciting of a film. I had never seen anything like it. It the performances were terrific. The filmmaking is just pitch perfect, like beautiful cinematography, very disturbing, very in, insane. And like I said, it's unpredictable, which is what you want for a horror film. We love serial killers. We know most of you do as well. This one's great because it subverts the genre on its head. And serial killer movies are so popular in America and true crime and podcasts and movies. We got the 20th shows. Dahmer adaptation. Yeah, we yeah. have. Yeah, like literally <laughs> serial killers in America have turned into brands. For they content. are. Yeah. Like that's why Dahmer movies keep getting made. That's why they keep making the same car- serial killers movies and content out of because name recognition. They're basically it's like Disney and Marvel of serial <laughs> killers which is horrible we don't like joke about that but this subverts the genre on its head it's something new and i highly recommend it if you haven't seen it we anthony showed me the south korean film a long time ago like he showed me more south korean movies uh-huh. i've seen but you know i was on south korean movies before squid game <laughs> years before squid Way game before parasite nobody knew what squid game was <laughs> um but anthony got yeah anthony got me into south korean film and obviously with like park chen wook's films and bong joon ho but this one is so cool and fun and like you don't get movies like this in America. Like really just that kind of filmmaking happens in South Korea. That's why there's more freedom. I love yeah. the movies that come out of there. And this is one that I highly recommend. Scary, terrifying. But again, it it, it flips the serial killer genre on you're, its head. You're like laughing half the time. You're like the serial killer is the one who's being hunted yeah. now. It's amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing. It was, it's a great take on the genre no, I'd never seen before. Because And then sometimes you get a like a serial killer movie where like sometimes they like are the protagonist of the movie. Yeah. You get it. You understand why they're telling the story that way. But I like this one a lot. Yeah, it's, it's actually a lot of fun. It's got great dark humor. Next, we have The Invisible Man, which came out in 2020. This got a release right before COVID hit, and it fortunately made a good amount of money to make its money back. So it, it only got three weeks of release. So it, th- it came out three weeks later, COVID hit. But it made $144 million at the box office. IMDb is a 7.1, which is shockingly low, in my opinion. I Rotten can't Tomatoes is 92%. Written and directed by Lee Wannell. It is starring Elizabeth Moss. And this movie was excellent. Anthony was like, dude, you gotta watch The Invisible Man. Watch The Invisible Man. It's like locked out. I was like, what else are you gonna do? So we finally watched. He's like, I'll watch it with you, man. I'll watch it again. I like. I watched it two days before. <laughs> it is so damn good. And I st- we still don't understand why people aren't talking Re- about this movie regularly. Yeah. This was one of the best horror movies made in the last five, ten years. Hands down, easy. Elizabeth Moss is such a great actress. She's so good in this movie. She's literally on camera the entire time. And, and, she, and she just like is a presence on screen. Just like when you watch Handmaid's Tale or any movie she's in, she's such an incredible actress. But this movie was terrifying. It's a a modern interpretation of The Invisible Man. And it's really, really ingenious in a lot of ways. But also at the same time, it's a story of a woman trying to escape an abusive relationship too, who's been trapped by a terrible guy. So different kinds of horror elements to this story. And this was when, remember when Universal was trying to do their new like, horror universe monster verse monster verse they had like the plans for the wolf man they made the mummy with tom cruise which bombed this was gonna be an invisible man movie in that franchise but they changed it yeah. after the mummy bomb johnny depp was gonna be the invisible man it was gonna be a huge budget production but the mummy failed and so they kind of scrapped their plans and they gave this to lee Wannell with only a seven million dollar budget and so this movie made a huge profit 144 million if it had come out it without lockdown it would have it could have made half a bill it could have hit that yeah. because to make 144 right before the lockdown happened and then it came back to theaters but like it was like months and months later so mm-hmm. i don't think it really even did much more but to do that much damage to the box office in less than a month like it would have skyrocketed to close to half a billion which would have been a massive hit. it is a massive hit but I, the the 7.1 imdb and the Rotten Tomato score is about the same for the audience. I'm not really sure why audiences haven't reacted to it the way you and I have. Because when I saw it, I thought it was absolutely sensational. Uh, an incredibly unique, ingenious take on such like a 
a, a great classic horror icon that has just was beaten into the ground with just the same thing over and over again. Um, wasn't there one with Kevin, Kevin Bacon, Bacon Hollow Man? Yeah. Then there was another one that nobody saw, super like direct to VOD. Um, but there was did it star John Cena? <laughs> <laughs> not gonna no, need not a big not suit. popular, but because you can't see him. <laughs> but the way that Waddle wrote this, it's a great script, and the cinematography direction is perfect. It's really, I think, a standout in horror of the century. It's I put it in the top tier list of just like one of my favorite horror films of recent memory. And if I, I recommend it to everyone I can, if you haven't seen The Invisible Man. Watch it ASAP. It's just really mind blowing. One of my favorite opening scenes in a horror movie in general, too, is in The Invisible Man. It is this movie had my heartbeat raised the entire time. It's it's just terrifying because the idea of like the person who's invisible can be anywhere at any moment. Yeah. And it's it's such a terrific movie. Mm -hmm. Can't re recommend it enough. Moving on to the next on our list, which is going to be Crawl. Another one that Anthony recommended to me, a horror movie that came out in 2019. Not many people saw it, I don't think, so on a budget. It did okay. I don't know what the budget is, actually. But in uh, on IMDb, it's a 6.1. Rotten Tomatoes, 84%, directed by Alexandre Aja. Aja. And this movie is about a girl who is being basically hunted by alligators or crocodiles. I can't remember which one it is, which species. I always mix them up. During when during a huge flood. A hurricane. A hurricane in Florida. in Florida. Yeah. And also there's like a levee that breaks too. So she's in a situation where she's basically surrounded by alligators and trying to escape and make it home. Yeah. And so the, sorry, I couldn't, I didn't look up the box office for this one. It made 90 million against a budget of 13. Oh, that's really So good. very successful. Um, but also the IMDb is only a 6.1. And I find I, I it's like mind blowing because I thought this movie was really like a pitch perfect horror film from start to finish, a great balanced structure for the storytelling. Barry Pepper is a supporting character. That's right, yeah. Akaya Scodelario is the the lead actress, and she did a phenomenal job. But the alligators, the CGI is really well done for such a small budget, uh, and they the filmmakers did a great job of keeping their presence hidden and covered under the water as much as they could. And the alligator attacks are shocking. Like, this is a movie that I watched and I screamed a couple of times, like, holy shit! Like, I was like, oh my god, this is insane! And it's just so invigorating, a movie like this. It gets your heart racing. Uh, and the suspense and the thrills, like, it's basically like an obstacle course of she's sure her and her father are trapped in their big home, which is flooding and alligators are getting inside. And it's about them trying to escape the neighborhood, which is completely just overrun with alligators all over the place. And they did a terrific job for such a small budget. It feels bigger than it is. And the, the scares, the thrills, the suspense, uh, it's just firing on all cylinders <laughs> and i really love it i think i think it was one of the best movies of that year and so i'm shocked at the 6.1 imdb it's pretty low for audience score there's a great father-daughter relationship yeah. in this as well and the character the lead character she's a great swimmer and an athlete so mm -hmm. she really holds her own in terms of trying to battle the alligators and crocodiles and escape them and everything like that so it's a really great push and pull of forces between her and the alligators it is terrifying yeah because it's alligators everywhere <laughs> it's so good yeah it's great <laughs> Moving i love on. it next up we have probably the most successful film on this list we have the ring which came out in 2002 has an imdb of only 7.1 and a rotten tomato score of 71 so it exactly matches the <laughs> critic rating uh, directed by the great director gore verbinski with a box office of 248 million. Now we grew up with this film. It's an, it's kind of an old. It's crazy to think that this movie is old now. It's technically yeah, classic. Yeah, classic so horror. it's over 20 years old. So I guess you can call it a classic. But Naomi Watts stars in this film, and it was a cultural phenomenon. Like even like scary movie, they centered one of their movies entirely around the plot of this. It was like the struck. It was like the baseline plot of the scary movie three. Yeah. It's an amazing film. It's a, it's adapted from a Japanese uh, fairy tale about the, a girl who lives in a well. Um, it's horrifying, and it's if you you've probably seen or heard of it, like it's the the, the tape. If you watch this VHS tape, <laughs> the VHS. Oh my god, urban legend. The VHS tape. You die seven days later, inexplicably, 
And Gore Verbinski proved himself to be a terrific filmmaker. He ended up making the first three Pirates movies, which are all just awesome action adventure movies. And I love this film. Hans Zimmer made the score, and it's really terrific. It's an amazing horror score. But Naomi Watts sells the film. It's an early role for her. It really, like this, she made Mulholland Drive, and then this, like a year later, and it she really blew up in Hollywood thanks to those two. Very talented actress. But I think this movie is really flat out just a stand out great picture. But why do we have it underrated if it was so successful? I think because it's forgotten. I think The Ring has been forgotten Same. by audiences, mainstream audiences. And a lot of young audiences probably never heard of it or seen it. Like you said, they may have heard of like the movie about the tape where like the lady's like staring at the mirror and stuff like that. And there's odd things happening. I think because this movie has just disappeared from the zeitgeist. Oh my compared God. Compared to how culturally relevant it was. Listen what? to this. So on Letterboxd, it only has 13,000 reviews. Yeah, so that's why that's nothing. it's underrated despite it was very successful. And it's not like a classic horror film that younger people know and love like The Shining or The Exorcist, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it's arguably still just very good. And I think because it's just been lost in the ether of movies that yeah. it's underrated now. And also just the the average ratings. There's a 3.3 on Letterboxd, 7.1 on IMDb. So audiences, they like it, but it's not really that much of like a loved film. Mm. I, I really love the film. I think it's yeah. terrific. It's wholly original too. Yeah. It's a great idea yeah. compared to most mar most modern contemporary horror films. Obviously, we're in a great boom, but what happens also in a boom is you get a lot of mediocre ones yeah. as well as the exceptional ones that we get. So I think this is just a great original idea in the 2000s that just helped propel horror. It, it helped bring horror back to life. I think so too. It was very original, and the the death scenes are terrifying. And there's the movie just has so much dread. It feels like because you're waiting for like, is she gonna die? Is she really gonna die? Can she stop it from happening? And it's just like you can feel that as an audience member. And I remember we've I've seen this a lot, and still when I watched it, I feel that dread. And it's just all around a great movie. Moving on to audition. This came out in 1999. IMDb has a set of 7.1 Rotten Tomatoes, 83%, directed by Takashi Miki, box office of $131,000. Again, another 7.1 IMDb. So, ah, odd. this movie, I saw it when I was in high school, and I was like, oh my god, it's one of the craziest movies I've ever seen. It's about a man who um, works within a casting company for film production, and his wife recently passed away, he has a son, and he's struggling to move on. And he's struggling to like, he's very depressed. And then his, his friend who works with the company with him comes, comes up with an idea of uh, what if we do a casting process for a film, but we're really casting like a possible uh, partner for you. And so they go through a bunch of actresses who audition for the role of this movie. And then he, he finds, they find a girl that he is just completely awestruck by. And then it's kind of like a manipulated, obviously, and doesn't age so well. But he means well, and it's like he's looking for a partner, just for, not just for like a hookup, you know what I mean? And then he finds a girl, and she seems perfect to him, and he's completely in love with her. But she ends up becoming, revealing herself to be much, much more sinister and messed up than he could have ever imagined. And gets him into a situ crazy situation. It's so disturbing, so original and unique, unpredictable. It's just such a fantastic movie, and it gets better on repeat viewings, too. And it's also kind of funny, but um, Japanese filmmaking is terrific, and it was so much different from anything I was watching at that time. And I was like, wow, this is just unbelievable. Excellent movie. Yeah. Next, we have Thirst. Came out in 2009, IMD, IMDb 7.1. 7.1, it's three okay. in a row. Rotten Tomatoes, 80% written and directed by the great Park Chan-wook, who's got a new movie coming out this year. And on a budget or on a box office hat, it had thirteen million dollars. Now, Thirst, I think, in my opinion, might be the best vampire movie ever made. And I used to always say that Let Me In, Let the Right One In, was my favorite vampire movie. But I watched this one recently, and now it's mine. It stars um, Song Kang Ho, who we all recognize and know from uh, many of his many, uh, Bong Joon Ho's movies, Bong Joon Ho and Park Chan Wook's movies. He's yeah. in Parasite. He's the lead character, the father. <laughs> Memories um, of Murder, the host. Thirst is. Just such a unique and creative take on vampires. He plays a priest who's trying to help people at a missionary that's trying to find a cure to this disease. And he offers himself up to try to help find the cure, gets infected by this disease, and 
gets Which thirsty. turns into a vampire. Gets thirsty yeah. for blood. It is terrifying. I screamed like five times, but also <laughs> very, very funny. Yeah, it's hilarious. Very original. Very South Korean, this movie, in terms of the story structure and how they tell their films over there. It's, it's awesome. You don't get movies like this in America. That's why we love them so much. But this movie... The, the action sequences are excellent. Just the the concepts of vampires that Park Chan Wook took and made him told it in his own voice is what makes it, I think, really special in terms of a vampire movie. He just does things differently than other vampire movies you've seen. So it's it's original, and we got new things from the the genre for sure. For yeah, me. I'm so surprised it's 7.1 on IMDb because there's really not a vampire movie like it, and he really did something in his own and with his voice. It's so funny. And it become like it becomes something else like halfway through the film. It like takes a turn, and you're like, "Wow, this is amazing!" It, it's just really enjoyable. It's so messed up, but in a good way. Uh, it's hard to describe without because we don't want to spoil anything because it, like halfway through this, like things change a lot, and mm-hmm. we don't want to give too much away. But it's got a great antagonist too. I, it's one of my favorite antagonists in horror movies. Just terrific performances from the cast and and Parks. He's just such a unique, creative filmmaker who always does something that you've never seen before, and this is an example of it. It's like a horror vampire fairy tale comedy messed up. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> Very clever, too. Really great writing. Yeah. But I think what really works is it's about a vampire who doesn't want to be a vampire. Basically. That's basically the, the heart of the film. Mm-hmm. Great take on it. All right, next up, we have another South Korean film. They're all over the place with this. Like They, they make such great horror movies mm-hmm. out there. The Wailing which came out in 2016, has an IMDb rating of 7.4, a Rotten Tomato score of 99%. It's 90. Oh, yeah, it is 99. Yeah. Written and directed by Na Hong Jin with a box office of $51 million American. So very successful film. Uh, critically, hugely praised. Uh, I discovered this on Amazon Prime. It's been on there for a while. Yeah, and... It had a really interesting poster, and, and then I watched a trailer. I was like, I gotta watch this. It just flat out blew me away. It was unbelievable. It's it's about this investigation going on, and there's spirituality involved. Uh, it basically is like a demonic kind of take on a horror, but with a different twist, more spirituality involved. And it's got one of the most unbelievable conclusions I've ever seen in a horror film, just in a movie in general. And it's a long movie, but, like, you're in it for the long haul. You're, like, every scene I was just, like, completely transfixed. The filmmaking is top tier. Like, one of the most beautiful films on this list. Really well-made film. Extremely well-acted. Um, terrific can- antagonist. Uh, mysterious as well. And I love the spirituality aspect. And we get that, um, what do you, not the, what do you call it? Like, that spiritual, uh, not a priest out there. The shaman. The shaman is excellent. I love that character and the rituals they they do in this film. There's a lot of graphic material in the movie, but also it's pretty funny. But I just think that it leads into one of the best third acts in a horror movie I've ever seen. Yeah, it takes place in a rural village, and there's a series of brutal, mysterious murders happening. And they started happening when this appearance and arrival of this stranger came to the town and village. So that's basically what sets up the mystery of what's happening to these people. And one of my favorite endings in a horror movie of all time is so incredible. Put this at the top of your list ASAP. It's so good. It was an ending of a movie where it was over and my like my spine was tingling. I, I was like, Jesus, that was so disturbing. Like, holy crap. It was like a, I had the same reaction as like the, after I watched The Exorcist. And it was just like, man, this is crazy. It's incredible. Next up, we have Deep Red. This came out in 1975. IMDb, it's a 7.5. Rotten Tomatoes, 93%. Written and directed by Dario Argento. Box office of $623,000. Dario Argento made a lot of great uh, Italian horror films, most famously Suspiria. But I put this on this list because I'd never see it on anyone's like lists of rankings, even of just like classic horror films. This is like one of the best just flat out slasher movies ever. Like this is like better than I think any of the screams. It has the dark humor. Uh, it's just really disturbing. And Argento has this tone with his filmmaking where it's like nobody... He's kind of like reminiscent of De Palma with like the the music that he likes to put in with the cinematography, uh, like that 70s zoom pole style. 
uh, beautiful filmmaking, but awesome gore, awesome kills, and the, it's a great mystery where you don't know who the slasher is for a while, and it's it's unpredictable. Like by the when you figure it out, you're like, oh my god, that was great, but it is very scary. And uh, the actors did a terrific job. Also, it's set in Italy, even though it's like mostly American actors. That's what Argento did sometimes, where they'll have like Hollywood stars, but like film the movie in Italy, and it's like an Italian movie. Gonna make a box office. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Gonna make money. Exactly. So, and of, and he often shot English language, um, very rarely with Italian. But uh, I think it's a tremendous horror film. Nobody ever talks about it, but I think it's right up there in terms of all-time slasher movies, really. Next, we have Green Room. This is an A24 film. It came out in 2016. IMDb is a 7. Rotten Tomatoes is 90%. Written and directed by Jeremy Solner. Box office of 3.8 million stars. The late Anton Yelchin. This is one of my favorite movies coming out of A24 since the production house started. It's about a punk rock band who goes to... They're like on like probably like a little tour. They're like playing these dive bars and, and concert halls and whatnot. And they play at a place that they don't realize is basically like a Nazi fascist hangout. And they play an anti-fascist, anti-Nazi song on stage, which causes to the audience to react poorly and start going after them. And they trap themselves, the band, inside the green room of the venue, which the green room, if you don't know, is where like the bands or musicians or comedians hang out before they go on stage and hang out afterwards. Yeah, it's after they they witness a, a murder mm -hmm. and that and then the owners of the establishment are like, you guys can't get out alive. And it's a great cat and mouse game of they're trapped, but they do end up with a with a firearm, so the Nazi guys can't just like storm the room and, and kill them, uh, risk getting killed. And it's just this amazing back and forth of both uh, opposing forces. Uh, one force is trying to kill the others, and the others, and the other force is trying to escape. Patrick Stewart is terrific in his role as the leader of this neo-Nazi fascist group. I hadn't seen him like that before. He showed a lot of range and talent that you rarely see with the big budget movies he's often in. Uh, but this movie is terrifying. It's messed up, and it's so well written. It's just a great script. Amazing ending. I love the ending. And, and uh, Imogen Poots is also in this. She's terrific. Her and Anton, uh, they were in a, a few movies together. Yeah, like Fright three. Night yeah. and another one as well. Uh, they're a great pair. But man, this movie is flat out um, a fun time. It's really, really excellent. All right, you want to do one more, then we'll go to our intermission? Let's do it. Take it away, bro. Next up, we have Happy Death Day, which came out in 2017. It has a 6.6 .6 rating on IMDb and a 71% Rotten Tomato score on a modest budget uh, made $125 million for Blumhouse. This was directed by Christopher Landon. Uh, Happy Death Day is basically Groundhog Day mixed with a slasher movie. And it sounds cheesy, and I didn't want to watch it because I was like, what a ripoff. And then I finally watched it, and I was like, this movie's amazing. It's funny. The horror is great. It's really entertaining. A lot of energy. And the time jump, the time loop really works. And the lead actress is terrific. She sells the movie. She's very infectious and charming. Uh, great range with the humor and the horror. And the villain's a lot of fun. Uh, it's set on a college campus, so there's a lot of ability to have that kind of college raunchy humor. But it's not like it's not like American Pie. It's more. It's it's not as dirty, but it's still a lot of fun. I love the film, and I think if you haven't seen it, you could definitely enjoy the film as well. With the comedy and horror, it's a hard balance to to meet, but the filmmakers did it. It's very much like Source Code, too, where she's yeah. trying to figure out, like, all right, the I'm mystery. in a loop. Yeah. I have to find out who the killer is. I suspect everybody. I can't trust anybody, but oh. she keeps going back into it, trying to figure it out after she accepts what kind of fate and, and loop she's in. Yeah, and it's, it's funny. Really great. It's funny because no matter what she does, the killer always finds her. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> I love it. Or she just gets killed by accident, like getting hit by a truck or something. It's Yeah, it's super funny. Yeah. And also, like, Edge of Tomorrow, really. Similar yeah, yeah, yeah. To, Like, when yeah. he's trying to escape the base all those times. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of trying fun. Trying to figure out the rules, trying to memorize everything. Mm -hmm. It's it's the same thing you've seen, but completely different at the same time. A lot of fun. All right, let's head into our intermission, everybody. Let's And then do we'll get it. back to more underrated horror movies. Before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to tell your friends and family members about us if they love movies and TV. Use our coupon codes and become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast for as little as $2. 
every patron has access to a weekly bonus episode. $10, $25, and $100 tier patrons get access to our Discord, where we interact with you and have watch parties. $25 and $100 tier patrons get a personal episode. You pick the topic, we'll do it for you. Also, $100 tier patrons get their own personal watch party. You get to be an executive producer at the end of every main episode. And after three months of being in this tier, you get to come on the show for a fun guest segment. Patreon allows us to do the show full time. So thank you so much for your support. Raiders of the Lost podcast is brought to you by our good friends at manscaped.com. Use our coupon code Raiders of the Lost at checkout. You'll get 20% off and free shipping worldwide from manscaped.com. Get their lawnmower 4.0 groomer. It's the ultimate accessory to your grooming needs. Has a 7,000 RPM motor. It's skin safe to the touch, so you won't nick anything down there. It's waterproof, has a built in light, wireless charger. You can use this thing in the shower in the dark. It's incredible. Manscaped's Boxer Briefs 2.0 just came out this year as well. And my goodness, are they comfortable? They come in really cool designs as well, but they got a little extra space for your junk, so you'll be very comfortable all day long wearing their briefs. Manscaped also carries two in one shampoo, conditioner, body wash deodorants. None of their products are used with any parabens or bad ingredients. They're made in the USA. Highly recommend getting their stuff. It's gluten-free and vegan as well. Go to manscaped.com. Use our coupon code Raiders of the Lost at checkout. You'll get 20% off and free shipping worldwide. Our other amazing sponsor is movieposters.com. Use our special promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today movieposters.com has a gigantic selection of pretty much every movie and tv show imaginable in their poster library as well as all sorts of options for sizes framing and even backlighting for your poster needs so whatever your needs are movieposters.com has you covered we have a bunch of these posters on our set as well as decorating our home and bedrooms they are high quality the best money you can pay for while still being very affordable Again, head on over to movieposters.com and use our promo code RAIDERS10 to get 10% off your order today. Now, let's head into our intermission and begin with the movie quote competition. Let's hear it. This one's easy, but it's, it's great. I love it so much. My mom and dad are going to be so mad at me. <laughs> You're wearing this shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the scream. <laughs> <laughs> Get a little woozy here, Billy. Feel a little woozy here, Billy. Okay, here's mine. In America, it's bling bling, but out here, it's bling bang. <laughs> what is this? Oh man, it sounds so familiar. In America, it's bling bling, but out here, it's bling bang. Slumdog Millionaire. No, Blood Diamond. Ah, oh, Leo. Guess this movie release here. The Faculty. <laughs> Elijah Wood, Josh Hartnett, directed by Robert Rodriguez. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go with 1998. He nailed it, guys. Yes. He nailed it. Guess this movie release here. Requiem for a Dream. 2001. 2000. Oh, man. Good guess. Good guess. Movie pop quiz time. How many feature-length films did John Carpenter direct? A bunch. Just counts TV movies as well. 22. 21. Ah! He also did the music for almost all of them. Yeah, yeah, he's a composer, (laughs) yeah. All right. What Marvel movie did Jennifer Connelly star in? Jennifer Connelly in a Marvel movie? Huh. Huh. Um... Well, you worded it. You didn't say MCU. You said Marvel. <laughs> You're like, but I meant MCU. <laughs> I'm not saying Jennifer anything, man. Connelly I'm not saying, I'm not saying nothing. Is she in? Is she in like the original Hulk movie? No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Hulk. Hulk with Eric Bana. Yeah. Oh man. She plays Betty Ross. Oh, you rat. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Good job. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Uh, who we got for uh, haters this week? Bro? We got a bunch. So we actually have we have a real hater. I'll get to you first. Uh, a very angry person. <laughs> okay, so 
this person wrote, so this is how it looks when idiots try when when idiots try explaining the obvious. Uh, this person commented in our this departed episode. Jeez Louise. Yeah. Okay, then we got some unsubscribes. Eric Kittingen wrote, Ender's Game. The guy who played Ender is actually Asia Butterfield, ah. <laughs> not Cody Smith McPhee. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I mixed them up. They look the same. And then uh, Kyle Yuzon wrote, Sack or Sacramento, not Sacktown. Unsubscribed. <laughs> <laughs> Toy Box Mafia wrote, Laser Guns. Unsubscribed. <laughs> All right, that's them. All right, now, uh, Godfather, we have anyone new? No, we're caught up to on Godfather. All right. Now, on this day in film history, today's October 10th in 1956, Giant, starring James Dean and Elizabeth Taylor, is released. In 1963, From Russia with Love premieres. In 1997, Boogie Nights is released. In 2003, Kill Bill is released. In 2014, Whiplash is released. And in 2017, Thor Ragnarok premiered. My streaming... My streaming recommendation for this episode is Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which is on HBO Max. And also, I mean, you should probably check out our new podcast called Hogwarts Legacy Podcast on all platforms. Yeah, that's a great streaming recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is Children of Men on Hulu. Amazing movie. All right, let's get back into our underrated horror movie list and go with a Nick Cage movie. We're going to talk about Mandy. This came out in 2018, directed by Panos Cosmatos. And this is just a trip of a film. Let me see. Let me see what the budget was on this. I don't, it probably didn't. It do can't have been much. Too much money. So it only made one point six million dollars on a six million dollar budget. Very unsuccessful. Movie. What year did it come out? Two thousand eighteen. Hmm. Unsuccessful movie for what I think is one of my favorite horror movies in the last ten years. Nick Cage is a monster in this movie with a great performance. He's the protagonist, but like, I've never seen a horror movie like this. The color scheme is kind of like a Nicholas winning ref and use of color in a lot of situations with fantasy really, yeah really really trippy film lots of cool visual effects and i can't recommend this movie enough and it's he's just basically a, a character he's a man looking coming out for revenge for the death of his wife and it goes in places you don't expect it to go it's dark it's funny at times tragic but the gore and the kills and the action are excellent and the monsters the creatures it's a blend of like fantasy with horror with just contemporary like sci-fi it's a weird john it's a weird blending of genres but it works it's really cool uh, i never seen anything like it before uh highly recommend very underrated very next up we have possession which came out in 1981 it has a 7.3 rating on imdb and an 84 percent on rotten tomatoes directed by andres zaluska zulaski i believe he's a polish director uh, box office of only $1.1 million to stars Sam Neill and Isabel Ajani. Isabel Ajani actually won both the, the Cannes and the Caesar Award for Best Actress for her performance. I think it's probably the most underrated performance by an actor of all time. She is unbelievable. Sam Neill's terrific as well. It's about this man who has a, a, a baby mama in Europe. And he's he's in Australia and he moves to her country to try and rekindle their relationship but she wants nothing to do with him and she's hasn't has an affair with another man and so uh, sam neil's character wants to confront this man it doesn't go well and then we slowly descend into madness where um the the ex-wife is just slowly slowly devolving into this crazy disillusionment of insanity and horror and creature feature it's in, but it's very metaphorical. I don't want to spoil anything, but once the horror gets going, it is really unbelievable. It's possibly the craziest movie I've ever seen in my life. It's absolutely mad madness and in a great way. And it's like the all of the beats of a horror movie, like it hits horror in such a way that so few films do. And it is there's nothing like it. It's, it can be a very disturbing watch, but very rewarding when it's over, and you're like, wow, that was effing insane. Effing insane. Wow, Anthony didn't drop an F-bomb. Wow. Watching the swears today. Wow, look at this guy. Moving on to Good Night, Mommy. This came out in 2014 out of Austria. IMDb, it's a 6.7. Rotten Tomatoes, 85%. Written and directed by Veronica France. Box office of two point two million. This just got remade into a media mediocre Hollywood <laughs> remake. 
I Amazon, recommend. I recommend just watching the original. It is an exceptional horror film. It's about twin boys. Might be the best twin movie of all time. Twinning. Twin boys whose mother comes home from getting facial reconstructive surgery. Her face is covered in bandages, but her demeanor and actions, personality, personality yeah. have changed in their opinion and in their perception. They think that maybe she's an imposter or she's not who she says she is. Such a great mystery and intriguing and terrifying. An incredible third act. Cannot recommend this movie enough. Yeah, it's a wild movie, and you've never seen anything like it before. It's a really brilliant concept, and the kid actors did a very good job, and then the lead actress did a phenomenal job. She's excellent, and it's – I don't want – we don't want to spoil anything, but it has an amazing twist, and when you find out what's really going on, you're like, wow, that was great. Really great movie. Mm-hmm. Next up, we have Jeepers Creepers, which came out in 2001. Wow. It has a 6 point, uh, 6.2 on IMDb and a 46% on Rotten Tomatoes, directed by Victor Salva, with a box office of $60 million. So very healthy box office on the very low budget it had. But critics and audiences don't really like this film. I enjoy this film. I think it's really cool. I think the, the creature design is awesome. Uh, really, the Creeper. The Creeper. Really original monster for a movie. I like his outfit, and uh, the, the actors did a good job. Uh, Justin Long's in this movie. It's, the original? Yeah, the original. It's like Dodgeball and this, I think, oh, yeah. came out in the same year. Uh, it's really cool. It's I like the concept. I like how small in scale it is, where it's just basically three characters, uh, very reminiscent of films like Spielberg's Duel. And uh, that's all you really need sometimes. Uh, it's a really cool horror film. I think it's good. It's just a big chase movie at yeah. the same time. You know, they discover this being in the basement of a church or wherever it was and yeah. it gets escaped and it they're on they're its prey they've been selected as the prey and they're just on the run for the from this being this monster it's really terrifying yeah i, I love chase movies i think they're really cool especially the original ones so i think it's a good time it's like a road rage movie with a monster yeah <laughs> yeah that's why it's, it's very reminiscent of, of duel that's because that whole movie is it's just chase scary stuff this was on tv a lot when we were young we too. watched it all the time yeah we watched a lot. <laughs> you say that about so many movies. We, we watched a lot of movies growing up. <laughs> He's always like, oh, yeah, we watched this every day. <laughs> I never said every day. We watched it a lot. Moving on to one of my favorite this on this guy. list. Drag Me to Hell from Sam Raimi came out in 2009. IMDb to 6.6. Shocking. Shockingly, though, Rotten Tomatoes 92%. Written and directed by Sam Raimi. I believe his brother helped co-write the script as well. Boxes, box office of $90 million. I adore this movie. It is just a classic callback to horror films from the 70s and 80s, directed by Sam Raimi. Great original idea. Just kind of like a classic approach to sort of like a haunting curse and sort of possession at the same time. I love it so much. It's got a great – and I think it might be my favorite ending in a movie of all time. It's up there. It's up there. It really there. is. Great acting. Justin Long's in this and well back. Yeah, yeah. back to back Justin Long. <laughs> but I think it's just wholly original and fun and very entertaining, funny as well. And the cast does a great job. But I just, I really, really enjoy this movie so and much. And it's really scary. And it's, it's terrifying. And it's very great, gross. Great too. mystery as yeah. well. Yeah, and yeah, I love the movie. Great music too as well. Uh, it's a, it's an awesome film. And actually, like it was the last movie Sam Raimi made until Doctor Strange. Mm-hmm. He took a huge break. But um, man, it's good. Yeah, yeah, this this woman gets a curse put on her, yeah. and she's trying to get rid of it or pass it off to somebody else if she can. I love it. I think it's I <laughs> it's think it's fantastic. Awesome. It's so it's good. So awesome. Are you the me? Are you Next up, we have Ready or Not, which came out in 2019 with only a 6.8 on IMDb, although it has 88 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Directed by Matt Bettinelli, Open and Tyler Gillette. This had a box office of $58 million, so very healthy box office for its small budget. Yeah, well-balanced diet. Yeah, it's, it's got to have a good balanced, healthy <laughs> box office diet. It's about this woman who is attending the engagement party for her and her future husband, and they're having the party at her fiancé's family home. No, it's home. the day after the wedding. The day after the wedding. Sorry, yeah, she's wearing the, the wedding gown. night. Yeah, wedding, wedding night. night. Wedding night, I'm sorry. And um, she's having— He didn't watch this all the time yeah, when yeah. he was a kid. <laughs> Yeah, I've only seen it twice. <laughs> but they're uh, having a, a, a wedding party with his family, and then the family reveals that they do this traditional hide-and-seek game. 
and it sounds like kind of cheesy. But well, that's not the traditional. The traditional game is you have to. They have to do this thing that select pick the, the game, game, pick the game, yeah. And the ready and the hide and seek is the worst option. Yeah, the worst. Usually, option, it's yeah. something silly. Yeah, but then she learns to discover that hide and seek is to the death, and if they find you, they're gonna kill you. And so she has to basically maneuver through this labyrinth of a home while evading the members of her fiance's family who are trying to kill her. It's really terrific. It's pretty wild. Yeah. I found it excellent. Really enjoyed it. A great ending, too. It's really very funny. Ending. Super entertaining. Yeah. Never seen anything like it before. Wholly original. Love it so much. And Samara Weaving, she's great. She's going to blow up uh, this year or next year. She's, she's in Babylon, Babylon right? Coming yeah. out. Next up, we have a film from a director who you're all starting to hear about, Ty West. But if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know we've been talking about this guy for quite a while and how underrated his horror movies are, especially... The House of the Devil. This came out in 2009. IMDb is 6.3. Come on, IMDb. Wow. You're killing me. Damn. 85% of Ron Tomatoes written and directed by Ty West. Box office of only $100,000. Now, this movie is a an exceptional callback to classic horror films. Just the filmmaking techniques that he uses. So many fun cheesy pans and zooms and stuff like 60 that. 60 millimeter, too. It looks yeah. excellent. Really great music, but in the energy of this film is awesome. It's about this girl who's in college. It takes place in, I think, the 1970s or 80s. 70s, yeah. 1970s. And she's trying to live, she's trying to find an apartment to live off campus. She doesn't have enough money. So she takes this babysitting job, this mysterious babysitting job, at this house in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, basically the title of the film tells you what this movie's about. <laughs> it is excellent. It, Ty West is an a really great director at building suspense and just patiently, patiently guiding you through a story and just making you so terrified, but entertaining you at the same way. It's really funny. But the third act in this movie, just like the third acts in all of his movies, are bonkers, insane. I was terrified. The first time I saw this movie, I was I, th I threw pillows across the room. Anthony was there. He saw it. <laughs> I love it so much. It's so much fun. I don't understand why his movies never make money. None of them make that much money. Finally, I mean, X X did pretty well. It's his most successful movie, but still, that's not like it's not like a Blumhouse success movie. I don't, I don't, I really, I don't get it because he makes great horror movies. Yeah, I, I don't get it either, man. I, I don't it's get a mystery. it either. But he, I love his filmmaking. He he uses classic techniques and uh, like this is shot with an old film stock and but it's got like all the zooms and stuff and it, it feels like it was made in the seventies. That's what's really cool about it, and it's got an amazing, a amazing finale and third act. And once you once you learn what's going on. It is horrifying. Like, the slow burn thriller is just really terrific. Next up, we have Videodrome, which came out in 1983. It has a 7.2 on IMDb, a 78% on Rotten Tomatoes. This was written and directed by the great David Cronenberg in a box office of $2 million. Cronenberg is one of the masters of horror, especially with body horror and surrealism, blending the two together. And this is a great example of it. I think it's one of his best movies, and it's never really talked about in terms of horror, uh, but it really is terrifying, very disturbing, so original. There's really nothing like it at all. Great performances, but like the the prosthetic special effects are phenomenal in this film for its time. It's really messed up, but also like such a great mystery of a story. Uh, it, it's really terrific, uh, but also very, very disturbing. If you haven't seen it and you're getting into Cronenberg, it's definitely a must-watch. Next, we have The Strangers. This came out in 2008. IMDb 6.1, Rotten Tomatoes 48%, directed by Brian Bertino. Box office of $82 million. This also just got, is getting remade right now. It's in production. Into a trilogy. And it's going to be a trilogy. Origins, where did they get the masks? It's about this. <laughs> <laughs> Star Scott Speedman and Liv Tyler, and they're a couple who go to a family vacation home. They're expecting like a nice, quiet, relaxing weekend. It's like a wedding party, right? Something like yeah. that. And however, they get the exact opposite when home intruders start to enter their life and torment, their home them, and torment yeah. them and torture them. And it's a terrifying movie. It's really scary. Um, highly recommend if you haven't seen it the original obviously is i think probably would be the best i'm curious to see what the the new one will be like um but i mean how many movies can you make about uh home, home invasion. invaders and make a trilogy of it we'll see i'm sure yeah. they got some kind of ideas but you know it's, i think it's just a great horror movie from the 2000s yeah i think it's really good uh, and people really like it i keep hearing from people like it's one of their favorite horror films um so it's very r low rating doesn't seem to be in line with 
like what I've seen and talked to people about. So I think they get, did a good job with this film on its low budget, uh, really good thrills, uh, pretty good scares. I would say on this list, it's my least favorite on this entire list, though. I'm not a huge, huge fan of it. i got to be honest. No, yeah, I agree. But I think it's underrated. Yeah. And it actually just reminded me of another horror movie that I think should be on this list. What? Funny Games. Oh! So Funny Games yeah. came out in 1997, directed by Michael Haneke. He also made the Hollywood remake that he did himself, and which came out in like the 2000s, I think, starring yeah, Michael Pitt. Yeah, 2007 or something. Now, yeah. Funny Games is also a home invasion movie, but I think it's just so well it's made. It's amazing. How it's, did we forget this one? Yeah, it's, uh, where, where was it German? Austrian. Or is it French? He's, um, it's Austrian. Or fr well, he actually made... Oh, it's Austrian. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's Austrian. He made a lot of French movies. Makes That's a lot why, of French yeah. movies as well. So it can he does either of country. Okay, so it's an Austrian horror film. This movie's excellent. It's about these two guys who just casually come into the lives of a family, again, on like a vacation, in a vacation home. But it's better than The Strangers. I think it might be oh, one of the best movies on this list. It's really terrifying, psychological... This, this, these two guys are just breaking this family down mentally. And I don't want to spoil what happens in the movie, but you got to check it out. There's some fun things like fourth wall breaks and, and stuff like that. Yeah, he was doing fourth wall breaks before it was popular. And the tone is all over the yeah. place in like the best ways possible. So I can't recommend Funny Games enough. It's, one of, the, yeah, the it's one of the best on this list. I, I love it. The, the remake's really good too. He, he, he did, did a great, great job. job. It's kind yeah. of sort of like a shot for shot. He did a really good job remaking like a lot of the same locations in terms of the set and the house design. Yeah, which it's is really, really interesting. Cool, yeah, But cannot recommend Funny Games enough. I love that movie. Great call, man. Great call. Next up, we have The Woman in Black, which came out in 2012 with a 6.4 on IMDb and a 66% on Rotten Tomatoes, directed by James Watkins, with a huge box office of $127 million with a budget of $10 million. This was Radcliffe's big movie after Harry Potter, showed audiences that he could do other films. Uh, I love haunted house movies when they're done well. This is one of them. Great cinematography, great music. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe is terrific in the film. Aw awesome cast. Um, I think this movie's really good. Very underrated. I think the ratings are way too low for it. I would give this at least like a, a 7.5 for a rating or close to an 8. Great atmosphere. Awesome mystery script. But it's just like for Haunted House, it, it does everything you want for that genre. No, yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah. And I think that Radcliffe... He needed this kind of movie, do something completely different from Harry Potter. And I think he fits really well in period pieces. I, he I, looks good in period clothes. Yeah, I think yeah, he should do yeah. more of them, too. I, I think it works. And I, I think it's a great mystery. Again, like you said, haunted house movies are, are excellent. Moving on to House. This came out in 1990, 1977, IMDb 77.3. Ron Tomatoes is a 91% directed by Nobuhiko Abayashi. Box office is an unknown, and this is kind of just like a, tr a wild, silly, great horror movie about this Vietnam War vet who returns to his boyhood home, and he's being haunted by ghouls and ghosts. It's the crazy. It's one of the craziest movies ever, and the surrealist filmmaking. It was made at the time on one of the biggest sets ever produced in that country, because it's all just amazing practical filmmaking, and cinematography, special effects is insane. It's so messed up and disturbing, and but the surrealist filmmaking is like, wow, this is extravagant and so bizarre, but it's really fun and horrifying, very scary, super, super trippy. It feels like you're like you're tripping out on acid just from watching it. <laughs> uh, highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Next up, we have Dressed to Kill, which came out in 1977. It has a 7.3 on IMDb and a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes, directed by... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, 7.1 IMDb, 82% on Rotten Tomatoes, written and directed by the great Brian De Palma, with a good box office of $31 million. This movie, it's a slasher flick, but also a mystery. Um, terrific performances, Nancy Allen, Michael Caine, amazing cinematography, fantastic synthy score. I love De Palma. Uh, nobody makes movies like he did. Uh, this is like up there, top tier slasher flick. Super fun. And you never see Michael Caine like this before. It's really fantastic. I love the movie. It's very scary, uh, but also very fun at the same time. Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Next up, we have Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Came out in 1988 Donnie. for Donnie. IMDb, it's a 6.1 Rotten Tomatoes, 76%. Written and directed by Steven Chiodo. 
box office of $43 million. Very this, successful. Yeah, it is. This movie yeah. is a trip. So it's about this town and these teenagers who just see this comet land near their home and they people go to investigate and we find out that these aliens have landed who look just like these terrifying clowns. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because everyone thinks it's a joke and they think they're real clowns, but then they start killing and harvesting human beings. <laughs> it's really messed up. It's I crazy. can't believe we watched this as kids. Like, we were really young when our brother showed us this. <laughs> it terrified me, but it's very scary. It it's, is. But it's also can't be fun at the same time. And the, the creature design is just fabulous. It's so fun and scary uh, simultaneously. Uh, the kills are great, uh, and it's pretty disturbing. Uh, but the tone is just like so unique in its own thing and there's really nothing like it in the horror genre it's really terrifying yeah. it really is because i think clowns are super creepy in general but yeah. i'm sure this one made people terrified of clowns in general as oh, well absolutely like i don't trust them anymore after seeing this movie <laughs> <laughs> they're not all alien monsters you never know that's true that's never true. know our final film on this list is a christmas movie <laughs> krampus which came out in 2016 it has a 6.2 on imdb and a 66% on Rotten Tomatoes to actually bookmark this episode, also directed by Neil Marshall, who directed The Descent. Sorry, I need to correct you. It came out in 2015. 2015, sorry. And this is basically a Christmas movie with this crazy folklore monster that is tormenting and haunting a family who is trying to enjoy... Well, no, they're not exactly enjoying their Christmas because a lot of people don't enjoy their Christmases when they have their entire family together because it's a shit show. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's got great elements of a family that doesn't get along as well as being haunted, hunted by a monster. Tony Collette's in it. Yeah. Yeah. Great Adam cast. Scott. Adam Scott. Yeah. Very good cast. I think it's really good. It made yeah, $61 million. That's a ton of money. Cool creature design. Uh, very scary. I, I think it's uh, really good cinematography as well. All around a solid horror It's film. really scary, too. Yeah. I, I highly recommend it. It's really cool. Great uh, movie, Monster. Very original. And Krampus wraps our underrated horror movie episode list. If you have any other ones, let us know. Obviously, there are plenty that we probably forgot about or left off the list or didn't even think about. Like, I thought of funny games while we were recording the episode. Smart guy. Let us know in the comments or DMs or whatever which ones we missed out on or which you would have liked to see. Maybe we'll do a part two to this episode. Who yeah. knows? I hope uh, if you haven't seen any of these movies to, that you check them out add them to your list, especially for this spooky season. These are some good movies to watch to get you in the mood for Halloween. Especially the international ones. South Korean ones, yeah. the Austrian ones. Great horror movies come out of those countries. Yeah, so the Japanese, the Japanese ones. Yeah. So can't recommend those enough i keep saying that in this episode thank you for tuning in to raiders of the lost podcast become a patron for as little as two dollars today at patreon.com slash raiders of the lost podcast take care everyone spooky <laughs> this episode of raiders of the lost podcast was executive produced by our chosen one patrons luke exelston tyler mcfly darren singleton anthony DeMeo, becca keen cody moen Benjamin Cook, Calvin Cam, and Lauren Smertz. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.